Hey there, I'm Nyx, and the topic of today's video is solving the find pivot index problem on the Leap Code website. As always, solving this problem in C++ and giving you a detailed explanation of the entire process, through the planning of the algorithm, to the coding of it, to the analysis of the time and space complexities, and looking at the Leap Code rankings. If that sounds good to you, then stay tuned. Welcome back. Now, we want to, given an array of integers, nums, calculate the pivot index of this array. And a pivot index is the index where the sum of all the numbers strictly to the left of the index is equal to the numbers strictly to the index's right. So basically, finding the balance point on a seesaw. If the index is on the left edge of the array, the left sum is zero because, well, there's nothing in terms of elements to the left. This also applies to the right edge via same logic. Return the leftmost pivot index. No such index exists. Return negative one. Okay. So we have lovely handy dandy examples here. For this one, Throughout this array, the output is 3, because at index 3 here, we see that to the left of this, 1 plus 7 plus 3 is 11. To the right of this number, 5 plus 6 is also 11. So that's the balance point where the numbers to the left and to the right are both equal to each other in their sum. Example two is a negative result here. One, two, three, there's no point in this array that has everything to the left and to the right equal in sum, so the output is negative one. And here, the index pivot point is zero at the very start because to the left we have a zero, and to the right, one and negative one is also zero. So that works as well constraints, anything interesting, eh, only the fact that we're never going to be given an empty array and it'll have at least one thing in it. Okay, so how to solve this? Well, let's take this example and see how to plan this out. Well, we're going to have to go through the array. We're going to have to loop through it some way. And say we start here. Well, we need to keep track of two things. We're going to need two variables. An integer that keeps track of, say, the sum of values to the left of wherever our position is. And a integer that keeps track of the sum of everything to the right of our position. However, at this point in time, the sum to the right is going to be equal to essentially the sum of everything in the array minus the number at the position that we're currently at. And when we move on to the next number, well, again, that right sum, which was equal to this entire sum minus our previous value here, well now it's equal to the sum of the rest of the array minus our new current positions value. And that keeps going on as we move down. For the left sum, it was initially zero. And then before we move on from one to seven here, we essentially have to add this value to that sum and then move on to seven and do the entire thing over again. So essentially what we're doing is three steps. We are at a position, we subtract that value's position from the total sum of everything in the array. We compare if that sum excluding our position is equal to the sum on the other side. If they aren't equal, we have to move on. If they are, we can just return the index. But if we have to move on, before we do that, we have to add our current value to that left-hand sum, and then move on, and then we do it all over again. So looking at this problem, sussing things out, we have a list of parts that our algorithm is going to consist of. We need those two variables, left sum and right sum. We now need to loop through the entire array and add up all of the numbers, because that value is going to be used in a second loop. We can say set the right sum variable to that total sum, and then every time we move, we adjust that variable and adjust the left sum as well. 
going through the three steps that I explained previously. If at the end of that loop, we get through it and we don't ever get to a situation where the right sum and the left sum are equal, well, we know that it doesn't exist and we just return negative one. With those sections of the algorithm, let's move on to actually coding that out. Okay, first up, I have an example here in a comment and I have the two integers, a left sum that I've set equal to zero and a right sum that I've set equal to zero. Next up is the ranged for loop that sets the right sum variable equal to the sum of all of the numbers in the array. So for int number in nums, the right sum is going to be equal to itself plus the number, which shorthands via this operator. Next is the loop that actually handles the comparisons and adjustments. This for loop goes from the beginning of the array to the end of it. And the first thing it does is set the right sum equal to itself minus our current value at the position we're at. Then it does the comparison. So if left sum is equal to the right sum, we get to return the index we're at. If that comparison is not true, we skip over it. And we then uh, set the left sum equal to itself plus the value at our current position. So for this for loop, let's look at this example here. From the previous for loop, we know that the right sum is 19 and the left sum from the initial declaration here is zero. So right sum is equal to 19, left sum is equal to zero, and we start at index zero. First thing we do is right sum is going to be equal to itself minus the value that we're currently at. And the value is five, so 19 minus 5 is 14. Now we do comparisons. Is the value of 14 equal to 0? Uh, no. Next, we need to prepare to move on to the next position. And as such, we take our value that we are currently at and add it to the left sum. So in this case, since we're all the way at the beginning, left sum is its initial value, 0, and then it gets 5 added to it. So left sum becomes five. We're at the end of the loop, so it iterates up and index goes to one. Now we do the whole thing over again. Right sum, again, is equal to itself minus the value that we're currently at. So the value is nine. 14 minus nine is equal to five. Ah, now when we go into this if statement, left sum and right sum, which are both equal now to five, three, plus one plus one is equal to five. Five is obviously equal to five. So here at index one, we have a pivot. So we can return i. The last thing to do is if we make it through this entire for loop and we never get a chance to get into this if statement, we need to return negative one because there is no pivot index. And with that, this entire code shouldn't have any errors going through that exercise. And it should work. We should not see any horrible green text. Or <coughs> red text. We want green text. Uh, your answer, expected answer, is equal to the same thing. So let's submit. And we want green, not red. Good. <laughs> Accepted. Okay, let's look at time and space complexity before we hit the button here. Uh, the In terms of space complexity, we only had to make two integer variables that take up constant space. So the space complexity is quite simply big O of one constant space usage. For time complexity, we look at these four loops. We're doing constant work in this one. We're doing constant work in this one. So basically they only are dictated by how many loops they're going to run. And that is essentially dictated by the size of the nums array for both of these loops. Two loops, both are dictated by n, the size of the array, but in big O, as always, we eliminate any constant values. We only take the biggest term. So 2n is essentially reduced into its magnitude of n. So this algorithm here has a big O of n time complexity where n is the size of the input array. And with that, let's see what the rankings look like. Okay, so we have some other 
solutions here that have longer run time, uh, much longer, but the vast majority of them have very small run times here. 742 test cases, wow. Uh, uh, this essentially distribution is, is probably encompassing all of the big O of N order magnitude problems. So if you do a lot of exercises resubmitting over and over again without changing any code, you'd probably see yourself ping pong within this distribution. And here, a fairly small range of memory, so you might vary more in this area here. But with only using two variables, it makes sense that we're fairly high up on the memory usage rankings as well. With that, this was how to solve the find pivot index problem on the Leet Code website. I hope you got something out of this video, and as always, I will wish you happy coding and to have a nice day.